When I was a child, I was quite nosy, quite precocious, very much a busybody. And my grandmother, Ruby Williams Briscoe of Aiken, South Carolina, pulled me in and said, hush, sit down, listen, and maybe you will learn something. I wish my grandmother was still here because she would know that I have spent my career listening. Over the course of the past three years, I've been fortunate to work on a project called Columbia SC63. And this project seeks to bring voice and visibility to the often overlooked struggle for civil rights and social justice here in Columbia. I've had the pleasure of working with a team of graduate students, undergraduates, archivists, photographers, media relations specialists, and we've pulled together a work that seeks to give a new perspective about the untold struggle here in Columbia. Many of us know the, the work in Memphis, in Selma, in Birmingham, in Montgomery. And what we've done, we've looked at newspaper articles, we've looked at correspondence, we've looked at moving images, and we looked at photographs. And all of that has unfolded a remarkable story of struggle of those individuals who sought to uproot injustice, bigotry, and discrimination in our own community. But for many of us, the greatest insight that emerged as relates to the history of our community came from those who lived and witnessed those dark and troubling times. One of the persons we've had the privilege of meeting and interviewing was Mrs. Donella Brown Wilson. I went to see Mrs. Wilson when she was in her mid-90s to interview her about her experiences. This is long before the Columbia SC63 project began. When I went to talk to Mrs. Wilson and her daughter, I told her I was there to talk about her life, and she looked at her watch and said, well, how much time do you have? And we made all the time in the world we could for her. She was born in 1909 in a little community called Fort Mott in Calhoun, South Carolina, Calhoun County. And Mrs. Wilson began to chronicle for us what it was like to be a young Negro girl in South Carolina at the turn of the 20th century. She told us about the discrimination she faced encountering Jim Crow and white supremacy. She told us about the inequities in education. She told us about the harassment that she faced as a young woman. She told us about moving to Columbia in 1916. And then she pulled down from her mantle a photograph of which she was quite proud. She said, I want you to see this. Now I should put a caveat and tell you that at the time I met Mrs. Wilson, she was legally blind and deaf. And so we had to shout the questions to her or have her daughter interpret what I was asking. But she could not see the photograph. She knew exactly where it was, and she knew exactly what the image contained. The date was August the 10th, 1948. Mrs. Wilson is at the front of the line, white dress, black umbrella. She was 39 years old. She was in a line in Ward 9 on Taylor Street near Benedict College. For Ms. Wilson, this was a great day. It was the first day that she could vote as a Negro resident of South Carolina. Mrs. Wilson was able to register and to cast her ballot 
because of one of her neighbors, one of the unsung heroes of the Civil Rights Movement, whose name was George Elmore. Elmore filed a suit against South Carolina in 1946. And in 1947, a federal judge ruled the election laws of South Carolina as unconstitutional. J. Wadey's Waring was a prominent white judge of South Carolina, from Charleston who ruled that it's finally time for South Carolina to become part of the Union. And thousands upon thousands of African Americans voted on that day. Mrs. Donella Wilson is now 105 years old. This is Mrs. Wilson voting in November of 2014. <laughs> to sit down with her, to be still, and to allow her to recount her experiences have added extraordinary dimensions to our understanding for the struggle for civil rights and human rights in our city and in our nation. Ms. Wilson was one among many individuals that we spoke to during the course of our project. Another individual that I spoke to was a gentleman whose name was Reverend A.C. Redd. Reverend Redd was the executive secretary of the NAACP between 1952 and 1956. I got to know him in his late years, and I would go visit him in his home in Augusta, Georgia. And every time I would see Reverend Red, he always had a line for this professor from USC. He said, you are a professor at USC? No, he said, are you a colored professor at USC? And I said, yes, I am. He said, well, I have you know that I grew up blocks from that university. And during my time, I could not touch a blade of grass on that campus. We've come a long way. And he would begin to chronicle how long that way was. He talked about his work here in South Carolina, registering people to vote. He talked about being chased by the Klan during that process. He talked about teachers being fired only because they were members of the NAACP. He talked about bringing great luminaries like Thurgood Marshall, who you see on the right. And this is a photograph from 1955 that Reverend Red took himself, where Thurgood Marshall comes to South Carolina to applaud the state for the work it did in the passing of the famous Brown versus Board of Education decision. Reverend Red also talked to me about another remarkable South Carolinian whose name was Sarah May Fleming. Reverend Red said it was important that this story be told. And every time I would come see him, he wanted to know if I had my gadget with me. And my gadget was my iPad. And he wanted to make sure I was recording his words. And with that gadget, I recorded hours of interviews with him as he told me incidents like Sarah Mae Fleming. June 22nd, 1954, the intersection was Main and Taylor Streets. Mrs. Fleming was 19 years old. She was a domestic worker on her way to work in a home in Five Points. It was an uneventful day until that moment. Ms. Fleming boarded the bus, she sat in a section which she later learned was reserved by law for white passengers. When the driver looked out of his mirror and saw Mrs. Fleming, he said, move, go to the back. She said on stand that when she heard this, she trembled. She was embarrassed. And so Mrs. Fleming said she moved toward the front of the bus to get off. And as she was moving, the driver extended his elbow violently into her abdomen. She backtracked and went through the crowd to the back of the bus where she exited on the corner of Main and Washington Street. Ms. Fleming experienced something that many experience, the cruel indignity of being black 
in public transportation. But on June 22nd of 1954, she did something extraordinary. She filed suit against the South Carolina Electric and Gas Company that operated the buses of Columbia for discrimination, racial discrimination. And for three years, Ms. Fleming fought this incident in the courts. Ultimately, her work led to the desegregation of bus transportation in the city of Columbia. Her story is one that must be told. Here is Mrs. Fleming in 1957. She's in the black dress. She's standing next to her attorney, Lincoln C. Jenkins, Jr. She's standing next to her witness, Mrs. Julia King, and to her other lawyer, the great judge, Matthew J. Perry, Jr. When Mrs. Fleming was asked by AP reporter why she persisted in fighting this case in the face of overwhelming odds, she said, because it was the right thing to do. And I hope it does not, does not cause any trouble. Well, Mrs. Fleming was right and wrong in her statement. It was the right thing to do. But little did she know how much trouble her work inspired. February 1st, 1960, four students sit down at a lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina. They were students at North Carolina A&T University. When the incident occurred, many said it was just a fad that would soon disappear. Little did people know that that sit-in in Greensboro would galvanize a youth movement across the nation that would lead to Charlotte, and Rock Hill, Charleston, Denmark, South Carolina, Orangeburg, and South Carolina, and, and, and Columbia, South Carolina. And here on March 3rd, you see four young women, Mrs. Martha Weeks, Mrs. Julia Barr, Mrs. Lula Ensminger, and Ms. Dorothy Rabb. They're sitting at a lunch counter on the corner of Blanding and Sumter Street at the Greyhound bus station. They were among 500 young people who on, on March the 3rd left the campuses of Benedict College and Allen University to register their discontent with the racial status quo. They were told by the governor of South Carolina at the time, Ernest Fritz Hollings, that you are not to leave your campus. This behavior would not be tolerated. They were told by their own college president, do not leave the campus because nothing will be gained from your work. But they refused to listen to the voices of the governor. They refused to listen to the voices of their college president. And they even refused to listen to the voices of their parents and some of their peers. Here they stand on the same day, March 3rd, 1960 at the corner of Maine and Taylor, the same intersection where Sarah Mae Fleming boarded the bus. And they're en route to Woolworths and to Cress and McCory's and Taps and J.C. Penney and Belk. They're on their way to sit in at lunch counters. And they defied all sort of expectations and opposition in doing so. A few weeks later, one of their leaders, Reverend Simon Bowie, was arrested on March 14, 1960, for sitting at a lunch counter at the Eckerd's drugstore. Reverend Bowie and his best friend, Tal McNeil, were arrested and convicted for trespassing. Reverend Bowie, like Sarah Mae Fleming, filed suit against the city of Columbia for his arrest, and ultimately, Reverend Bowie was vindicated in a 19 64 Supreme Court decision. Reverend Bowie was also part of another galvanizing moment in February and March of 1961. Against the advice of the governor, against the advice of their college presidents, against the wisdom of their own parents, over 300 students met in the sanctuary of Zion Baptist Church. They were there to register 
their discontent once again with segregation in South Carolina. They left Zion and they marched through the streets of downtown Columbia to the South Carolina State House. They walked around the grounds of the State House. They were met by one of their leaders, the Reverend David Carter, in the tan suit. And Reverend Carter was a veteran of the Korean War, but also was one of the staunch champions of the NAACP. As they were walking, they were told they had 15 minutes to leave the grounds of the State House or face arrest. As they were walking, Reverend Carter raises his voice and says, do you want to be free? And the crowd gives a rousing yes. Then Reverend Carter says, let your conscience be your guide. And all of a sudden, these young people begin to break out in singing and dancing and clapping. And as they do so, they're being arrested by the Columbia Police and the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. What are they arrested for? They're arrested for disturbing the peace. They're arrested for singing and clapping and dancing. They're arrested for singing a song entitled, We Shall Overcome. They're arrested for singing a song entitled, Let Nobody Turn You Around. And they were arrested for a song that says, like a tree planted by the river, we shall not be moved. And they were arrested for singing this radical anthem entitled, The Star Spangled Banner. One of those arrested that day was a 17-year-old art student from USC whose name was Frederick Hart. Frederick Hart came upon the protests at the State House. He saw one of the young African-American males being arrested. He went to the police car to shake the man's hand, and the policeman said, are you a member of the NAACP? And Frederick Hart said, yes, I just joined. And Frederick Hart was arrested along with his other 187 students. Frederick Hart goes back to the campus of the University of South Carolina, where I am now employed. He was harassed and demonized and called a liberal communist conspirator, an outside agitator from Falls Church, Virginia. Frederick Hart responded to his critics by writing a letter and he wrote in the letter that sympathizing alone is not enough. You must be willing to stand up for that which you believe is right. And Frederick Hart said, now is the time to stand. And he quit school at USC and goes on to an extraordinary career as an artist. If you've been to the National Cathedral in DC, or you've seen the monument for Vietnam soldiers on the, mar on the, mar on the Mall of Washington, you've seen the work of Frederick Hart. Another individual who joined Hart that day was Lenny Glover. Lenny Glover was also arrested. And a few days later, Lenny Glover goes to the local Woolworths to do another sit-in. And while he's there, he is stabbed by an unknown assailant. Lenny Glover's near-death experience galvanizes the movement yet again. But what is most profound is that Lenny Glover was not done. Weeks after his recovery, Lenny Glover goes back to downtown Columbia, back to Woolworths, and he stands in front of the great photographer Cecil Williams with this sign. This store bears the blood of Lenny Glover. Beware of Woolworths. In 1963, Lenny Glover, Frederick Hart, David Carter, and all those you saw in the photograph were ultimately vindicated by the United States Supreme Court in a famous case entitled Edwards v. South Carolina. This case condemned the state of South Carolina for violating the rights of free speech and assembly of these students and said the state violated the 14th Amendment of the Constitution by making criminal the expression of unpopular ideas. Few in the room would ever know 
of the Edwards v. South Carolina ruling. But you may, have, you may know of the famous boycotts in Birmingham, Alabama that happened weeks after this ruling. Those boycotts where you saw police dogs and fire hoses. Those boycotts where the litigants used this case as one of their defenses. You may have heard something very recently about a famous march in Selma, Alabama, from Selma to Montgomery. Well, in that same litigation, to permit that march from Selma to the State House of Alabama at Montgomery, they used Edwards v. South Carolina as part of their defense. Our story does matter. Someone who is mindful of the work of the movement here in South Carolina and in Columbia was this young man. Today, he would be 86 years old. This is Martin Luther King Jr. at age 30 here in Columbia, 1959, for a meeting of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Dr. King comes to Columbia to embrace the movement here. Behind him is the famous Montgomery bus boycott. Behind him is the incident of Rosa Parks. Ahead of him is the March on Washington, the letter from the Birmingham jail, and that sad and tragic day in Memphis. Also ahead of him was December of 1964, when he accepts the Nobel Peace Prize. On that afternoon, when he accepts the Nobel Peace Prize, he calls the names of individuals who were a part of the movement. And he said that he hoped one day men and women and children might know the names and the stories of those unknown individuals who were willing to suffer for righteousness' sake. The story of Columbia and the story of our movement does matter. Today, as we celebrate King Day, Today, as we gather for reflection and contemplation, we should also be mindful of our history as we've been reminded throughout today's discussions. History for us is not simply a dusty book on a shelf. There are meaningful and impactful stories. What lessons might we learn from the struggles of Sarah Mae Fleming? What lessons might we learn from the work of Donella Wilson or Lenny Glover? or Frederick Hart? What might we do to write our own name on that empty page of history that is waiting for us? Dr. King said in one of his great speeches that the movement requires all sorts of individuals, with all sorts of motivations, perspectives, and persuasions. And he said, I would love to have someone in the movement who can fly, but if you can't fly, I hope you will run. But if you can't run, I hope you'll walk. And if for some reason you can't walk, I hope you'll crawl. And if you can't crawl, then just move. Today, as we look at the landscape of South Carolina and this nation, we made tremendous progress. And yet, the problems are profound and pronounced. In the face of failing schools and failing education, I hope someone will move. In the face of poverty and disease, someone should move. In the face of intolerance, bigotry, and discrimination, in the face of a flag that still flies in front of our capital, Someone should move. In the face of apathy and disinterest, someone should move. For your sake, for our sake, and for history's sake. When I was a child, when my father would conclude his sermons, and he's a Baptist preacher in this great town of Bamberg, the same town, hometown as our governor. He would conclude his sermons, and every now and then this old lady 
would sing this song entitled Hush. The song went, hush, hush. Somebody's calling my name. Hush, hush. Somebody's calling my name. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do? In my tradition, the voice is the voice of God. But in your tradition, it might be another spirit, another higher power, another issue. But I hope each of us will hear that voice. And I hope each of us will do our homework. Hush. Sit down. Listen. And hopefully learn something. Thank you very much. <laughs>